Hi, um, my name is Jen Seidel. I'm with the Calvert Library, and thank you for joining the Calvert Library and the Master Gardeners today for this herb workshop. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. You are muted, and um, feel free to use the chat feature. If you have any questions, if you could use the um, Q&A box and just type your question in there and um, the program will stop periodically um, to answer questions. Um, so the program is being recorded and it's also being streamed on YouTube. It will be available for 30 days. So I would like to um, welcome today uh, Master Gardener Elisa Miller and uh, Elisa, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, using herbs and how to preserve, harvest, and grow them. I am a master gardener. Um, I'm part of the class of 2014. Um, so what is a master gardener? So we follow the University of Maryland extension, which goes through the agriculture and natural resources and is part of the University of Maryland. So we get trained by professors and other professionals in the field of horticultural. So we, are very, we get a lot of knowledge um, from becoming master gardeners. We also do lots of programs and different practices in baywise, composting, grow it and eat it, native plants, pollinators, and plant so what is an herb? An herb is a small seed bearing plant with fleshy rather than rooty parts. It also is, um, it refers to plants that are valued for their flavor, fragrance, medicinal properties, and helpful qualities. Um, also, a lot of herbs in the past have also been used for coloring dyes. Um, a simple, I think, definition for herbs are just plants with the savory or aromatic <laughs> properties. Um, so they um, produce good flavors and to garnish your food, as well as you can use them to make your house smell um, good. Okay, there are lots of types of herbs. So when you think of herbs, you think of things like basil, you think of things like chamomile, um, also the um, parsley and cilantro, but you don't think of honeysuckle or lilacs or pawpaws um, or even types of ferns as an herb. But these um, herbs can fall into six categories, including trees, shrubs, perennials, vines, annuals and biannuals, and ferns, mosses, and fungus. So when you go and get a book on herbs, some of them will be listed, some of them won't be listed, um, a great resource to learn about medicinal plants and herbs is Peterson's Field Guide in Medicinal Plants and Herbs by Stephen Foster and James A. Duke. Um, they have several plants that were historically used medicinally. Um, that's where I get a lot of my information when learning about medicinal plants. I'm not going to talk about medicinal plants um, today because I'm not a doctor. I don't have a background um, in telling people how to use um, herbs medicinally, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, so let's continue. Okay, so growing herbs. In general, most herbs need full sun and well-drained soil. Very few of them will take wet soil. In fact, wet soil is the best way to kill herbs. Because mo think about it, most of them are very soft tissues. A few of them have hard um, tissues like the rosemary and lavender and even the thyme. But they can be easily killed if their root system is 
overly wet, you can also grow herbs in a container, raised beds, or directly in the ground. Containers are actually a good way to grow herbs because you can put the container close by your house. You can put them like on a um, deck or right by a doorway where it gets sun and you can harvest those herbs whenever they're needed. Also, there are a few herbs. Annuals are herbs that have their life cycle in within one year. So those are the basils. Um, so they will only last a year. Another annual includes borage. Borage is a medicinal plant. It, a lot of people confuse borage and comfrey because they look awfully alike. But comfrey is actually a perennial. So um, there are a lot of herbs out there, both perennials and annuals, that get confused with each other. Yarrow and Queen Anne's Lace are another two um, herbs that get very confused, as well as um, things like um, chamomile and feverfew are also confused. So when you are harvesting herbs, you have to make sure that you know exactly what herb you're harvesting, um, because a lot of herbs can be confused with things that could um, harm you or get you sick. Um, some herbs, if you, you are allergic to certain things, can cause stomach aches. So when you're trying a new herb, make sure you, you take it in small doses um, and you make sure that they, you don't spray them with any harmful chemicals because when you harvest herbs, you're getting the leaves of the herbs. So any pesticides is not a good thing to spray onto your herbs because you are going to digest and use those leaves um, in your cooking. Also, one great tool to when growing herbs is know your the harness sound. Um, I have the United States harness um, website that will tell you if you're able to grow an herb in your zone. In Maryland, we are both salmon A and salmon B. So we can grow a lot of herbs here in Maryland. Um, so we can grow a lot of stuff. Where to grow herbs. So you need to know what is your soil texture. So soil texture includes is it wet? Is it dry? Is it does it stay moist? Um, you also have to understand how much sun. Do you get a lot of sun? Do you get a little bit of sun? Like maybe you have an area that gets morning sun and afternoon shade, or is it an area where it gets shade but it's under a tree, so therefore it gets a little bit of light but not really direct light. So you have to know the area. Like I said before, herbs require mostly full sun and well drainage. You don't want to put any of your herbs in something that is like wet, that stays wet. Um, that um, area usually means that it's probably good for a rain garden. And I don't believe there's any herbs out there that would be good in rain gardens. Because like I said, they don't like their their roots getting really wet. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay. I'm gonna say that there's no questions. Okay, so growing herbs, um, you can grow them as a cutting. So you can grow lavender and lemon balm and oregano, a few mints and rosemary. When you're doing cuttings, you want to do the newest growth. So when you're harvesting rosemary or lavender to propagate as a new plant, you want to take it, you, can, you need to have the newest growth, so the soft tissue. You don't want to cut it where it's the hard tissue if you're going to 
grow herbs by cuttings. You can also do it by root division. Um, I've had great luck with root division as far as oregano and the mint. So you can um, divide your plants by root division, especially if there's an area and your mint or even your um, oregano has spread. Most of those plants are individual plants with roots. So you can dig them out and get some more plants through root division. Also seeds. Um, this is probably the best way to get more herbs for your garden. Um, as you are harvesting, um, make sure to allow your all your herbs to grow to seed because if you keep on harvesting all your your herbs and say there's an animal that you really love and you don't give it enough time to flower and seed, um, that's probably not a, um, a good thing, especially if you don't want to save some money into buying herbs every year. So the best thing is to allow your herbs to go to seed and um, harvest the seeds later. But you can cut them um, up to a point and then decide, okay, I have enough to dry out this year. I'm going to go and allow the rest of my plants to go to seed. Vegetables, herbs, and flower companions. So um, you can start a herb garden separately, or you can actually entwine a lot of your herbs with a lot of your vegetables that you're going to plant. Um, you can grow them on the edging of your beds, or you can put them in a container that you can move around your vegetable garden. So a few herbs companions with vegetables include beans, like basil and borage and sage and dill. Carrots can um, grow with calendula and chives. Corn um, can grow with sunflowers and nasturtiums. Cucumbers, um, you can grow dill and nasturtium. Eggplant, basil and marigolds, kale, dill and marigolds. A lot of things like marigolds. Um, melons, also like marigolds and nasturtium, peppers, basil, radishes, like nasturtium, spinach, like dill and yarrow, squash, like catnip, and fennel, and tomatoes, of course, like basil and board. So what you can do is you can go and plant these um, herbs with your vegetable crop. They don't have to be separate. Any questions so far? The main thing is okay. everyone's excited to receive your slides, Elisa. Okay. <laughs> um, I will send out an email with all the copies of the slides. Okay, so harvesting herbs. So when you harvest herbs, you want them at their, when the oils are at their peak. So this happens before the flowering stage. Um, unless you are harvesting like chamomile or bee balm specifically because of the flower, you're going to use the flower of both for teas. You can also use some of the bee balm and wild bergamot um, leaves for teas. Um, so you, as you are waiting for those plants to flower, you can also harvest the leaves for them. Also, um, besides harvesting before they flower, you also want to harvest in the morning, but you have to allow the dew to dry off from the leaves. If you harvest herbs while the leaves are still wet, it's going to produce a lot of mold and fungus, especially while you're waiting for it to dry. Um, you can cut back um, your herbs that are annuals up to 50%, perennials only 30%. Um, so your, your basil, you can harvest that as long as it's a big plant up to 50%. I don't recommend harvesting 
um, middle seedlings of your basil just yet. If, and once they become a pretty good sized plant, you can go and harvest. But again, basil, you need to allow to give it some time to produce those flowers so that you can get seed for the next year. Um, do not collect if plants have been sprayed. I do not recommend people getting herbs off of roadsides or public gardens. You do not know if those have been sprayed, if they have any chemicals on them. Just harvest the plants that you grow yourself. Okay, so after harvesting, there's a way to keep your herbs for later use. You can use screen drying. Um, it doesn't have to be technical when you're screen driving. If you have an old like window screen that's broken, maybe there's a hole, but most of it is in pretty good shape, you can actually use an old window screen to use as a um, screen for your herbs. So a lot of herbs you um, can screen dry. Um, the most common ones are, include the fennel, dill, basil, the hyssops, and the mint. Um, so you can screen dry a lot of herbs like that. You can also um, dry them by bunches. So a bunch is when you collect a whole bunch of herbs, tie them up, you can use an old matter, or you can put them somewhere in your kitchen. Um, a lot of herbs like lavender produce seeds. So, um, and some of them, when they dry out, their leaves start falling. So what you can do is you can use like a paper bag Paper bags um, bring in a lot of air. Um, what you don't want to do is use a pillowcase because then if there's any moisture, um, it will keep trapped into the, the um, pillowcase and your herbs will just get moldy. So when you are hanging them, you want to use a paper bag because it, it brings in air and helps them keep dry. Um, when um, I dry roses, like the um, flavor roses, I will put them, take them, the petals off the roses and just put them in a bag and shake them every few days. And it's, I have not gotten any type of molding that way too. So if like say you are drying lavender and you just want the beautiful flowers, you can just cut the flowers and put them in a paper bag and just shake them for a few days. Or you can just hang them um, and dry them as a bunch and just put the paper bag so that um, it collects the flowers. Any questions so far about as far as drying the herbs? Okay. So now we're going to go on to storing your herbs. You can store them um, as fresh, frozen, or dried. Um, I, when I store them as fresh, I get like a mason jar or some sort or a recycled glass jar, and I will cut, say, my parsley, and I will put the parsley and into the water and put them in the refrigerator. And they pretty much stay pretty good um, for a few days. But the best way to actually keep your herbs pretty for later use is actually drying. Um, the golden rule as far as cooking is for every tablespoon is for fresh herbs. So you need a lot more fresh herbs for, to do a recipe because fresh herbs don't have as much flavor as dried herbs and you want to actually use a lot less of dried herbs in your cooking. So you only use one teaspoon of dried herbs. 
for your recipes because dried herbs actually have a much stronger taste than fresh herbs. Um, that's why a lot of people will use dried um, herbs like your mints and um, other plants for their teas rather than putting it as fresh um, because it is much more flavorful when you um, dry them. Freezing, it can be kind of tricky because a lot of herbs, they um, they don't freeze very well, in my opinion. Um, they turn kind of like a dark green to a black. Um, so I don't really recommend it unless there you have no space at all. Um, but um, frozen, I would say use it within a year because they don't, they get kind of bad after that. So they don't have as much of a lifespan when frozen. Okay, um, here is a list of all the herbs that you can dry. A lot, majority of herbs that you grow in your garden can be dried. A lot of them also can be used um, fresh Okay, we're going to talk about a little bit about teas, meats and greens and butter, butters and oils. So a lot of herbs like hibiscus, bergamot, uh, all the mints, you can infuse in teas. Um, when you are infusing leaves for your teas, you need at least five to ten minutes to infuse it so that you get the most flavor for your book. Um, if you are using something like a coneflower or even a dandelion, you're gonna use the root. So if you're gonna make a tea out of root or even bark, you need to um, infuse it in boiling water for at least 20 minutes. So when you do leaves, you just need just hot water and put it in your teacup with a strainer for five to 10 minutes, but bark and roots, you need to put it in really hot boiling water on the stove for at least 20 minutes, just so that it gets the flavor of whatever herb you're using. Meats and greens. So here's a list of all the herbs you're gonna use for all your your recipes, whether it's a chicken recipe, a stew, a beef recipe, vegetables, a lot of herbs you can use in cooking. You can also create your own butters and, butters and oils with many herbs. Um, a lot of common butters and oils include rosemary and thyme. Um, a few will use basil as well, depending on what you're going to use the oil for. Most oils that you use, like for tomatoes, will use a lot of basil in them. So this is a list of ways you can use herbs in the kitchen. You can also use herbs in your home. Um, you can use um, herbs in sachets put them in like a sock drawer or somewhere that you find that stinks up a lot. You can use lavender and rosemary. They pretty keep pretty well. You can also use, use them in soaps and oils, um, cleansers. Southern wood is a very old um, plant. It's very hard to grow. Um, it's actually much more finicky than lavender and rosemary. Um, I've killed many southern wood and still trying to figure out what's going on with that plant. Um, it is a tricky plant, so I don't recommend southern wood for new herb garners um, because it's so tricky. Um, I would prefer something like lemon balm or even the lavender as an alternative cleanser. Repellent. So repellents um, include things like you want to repel mosquitoes. Um, you can use anything 
that has a lemon type odor. Um, for whatever reason, mosquitoes do not like any smell and that smells like lemon. So lemon balm, lemongrass. Um, I've heard also that they do not like um, bee balm. So all those kind of um, herbs will repel um, mosquitoes. First aid, there's a lot of herbs out there that um, will help with scrapes, bruising. Um, among those are the comfrey and borge. Historically, they were used um, as salves to help with scrapes and bruising. Also, uh, not a lot of people know this, but a few herbs actually also can attract birds. Um, I got this list from the um, Audubon Society. Um, they have a great list of plants to grow to attract um, birds. And you'll notice that witch hazel is probably one of the best herbs. Um, it's an, another medicinal plant that helps with scrapes and bruising. And um, it attracts a whole bunch of birds as well as sunflowers are great for um, birds like the golden finch who eats a lot of seeds. Um, they love um, sunflowers. Another herb that um, most people don't think when it comes to hummingbirds is the passion flower or passion fruit. Um, it will attract them. In fact, uh, last year, I had some passion fruit and two male hummingbirds were actually fighting over the territory. So um, that's another um, herb that you can grow, but be warned, uh, passion fruit can get a little out of hand. Um, I started with maybe five plants and I probably have like 15 plants this year. So they can be aggressive so if you're going to grow passion fruit this year, put in an area that you don't mind that it grows aggressively. It will die during the winter, but it will come back when the soil temperature is warm. Also, a lot of herbs not only attract birds, but they also attract bees and butterflies. So some um, herbs that I found very helpful to have in my garden that do attract the bees and butterflies include the anise hyssop, coneflower, um, sunflower is very good. Also wild bergamot and bean balm are great for a lot of pollinators. It's been rare that I've seen a butterfly be attracted to rosemary, but I don't think my rosemary has flowered yet, so I haven't seen that. But I've seen tons of bees on lavender um, book shrubs, so a lot of plants will attract um, bees and butterflies. So if you are having a hard time attracting bees and butterflies in your, your yard, maybe plant a few herbs as well as um, a few of your native plants will help bring in more pollinators as well. Okay, good bugs. We all want good bugs in our gardens. So we do want the ladybugs and the parasitic wasps. And these are just a few plants that will attract those insects. So um, dill, fennel, yarrow, boneset, cilantro, and lemon grass are great herbs if you are finding that you're not finding a lot of insects in your yard. Um, these will attract a lot of the good insects, including the lightning bug. Um, so these would be great for your yard as well. Beneficial insects. So ladybugs, they're attracted to anything in the carrot family. This included, includes the veg and um, 
dill and um, they're attracted to a lot of plants. Pirate bugs, they're another great bug to have in your garden. They like daisies, they like verbena, parasitic wasps. If you have a big problem with the tobacco hornworm, they're a great insect to get into your garden. They like dill and fennel as well as angelica. One thing about angelica is a lot of people get confused when they're planting angelica in their garden with things like parsley and the veg because they have a very similar leaf to them. Hoverflies is another great pollinator to bring into your garden. Um, they are attracted to cone flowers. They are especially attracted to wild bergamot and bean balm. These again, um, they love things like hyssop and gorge and comfrey. And again, the butterflies love basically anything with a fragrant flower. Herbs that repel be, um, pests. We got deer all over Maryland, so um, they tend to not touch the wild bergamot or bee balm. Moles and voles are everywhere too, so you can plant things like calendula and marigolds and they tend to stay away from them. Rabbits are a big problem again. Mexican marigolds are good. Other rodents like the voles and and the field mice, they don't like chives or any of the mints. Aphids hate chives or dill or coriander. Ants, I've, I've seen a lot of ants in my bed, so they tend to not like any of the mints as well. Beetles, um, when I'm talking about beetles, I'm not talking about the ground beetles, I'm talking about the Japanese beetles. So they tend to stay away from roses that are surrounded by chives or catnip. And there's a list of other plants that I found that they don't like. Um, flies, um, if you have a big problem with those little flies, especially carrot flies, um, you can grow things like basil and chives um, with your vegetables that maybe are getting attacked by the carrot fly. Um, also mosquitoes, again, basil, bee balm is great. Um, if you have a mosquito, a big mosquito problem, just having these herbs in a pot in your in your entrances are a great way to to stop the mosquitoes from entering your house. I have like a whole bunch of containers of mints just to to stop the mosquitoes from coming in. Okay, one other pest that I know a lot of people are concerned about right now that I didn't miss are ticks. So um, an interesting story is I had a cat um, maybe like 10 years ago. She was an indoor outdoor cat. This cat never got fleas or ticks. And I often wondered why. Well, we had a big lavender and rosemary bush along our walkway. And she would spend possibly third to half of her day just sitting there and she would rub her fur along those um, bushes. And finding out ticks do not like the scent of or the oils from the rosemary or lavender bush. So she was a very smart cat um, in doing that. So for if you have a problem with ticks, Rosemary and lavender, not only are they great smelling bushes, but they also deter the, um, the ticks. Okay, so unfortunately, a lot of plants do attract pests. So if you find that some of your, your plants are getting eaten by snails or slugs, do not 
plant anything in the marigold or calendula family. They also love sage or in violence. So if you have big snail or slug problem, don't plant those near your plants. I've also heard that snails and slugs are attracted to mints. So if you have mint and you have a plant that is being attracted by snails or slugs, don't plant mint anywhere near them. But they are repelled to um, fennel, garlic, and rosemary. And also, remember, snails and slugs are um, good treats for toads and frogs. So you can always have like a, a broken pot and put it in the ground so that the toads and, and um, frogs can move in. Also, caterpillars, tobacco, hornworm is attracted also to mint, parsley, anything in the parsley family, but they are repelled by the borge and dill and thyme. Um, like I said, Japanese beetles are attracted to basil, raspberries, and especially roses, but I find that they're repelled by the chives and catnip. Aphids are attracted to angelica, basil, and calendula, but um, I have not found anything that actually repels them. I haven't read anything that repels aphids. What you can always do is try to plant stuff that will attract things like your ladybugs because they will take care of the aphid problem. Millibugs, again, they're attracted to aloe and rosemary and white flies are attracted to the geraniums and your bambina and rosemary, but they're repelled by um, the basil and French marigolds and nasturtium. Um, the, if there's a plant that is getting um, infested with any of these pests, learn what is the bug that will take care of them. So find out what is the predator of that bug and then plant a plant that that predator likes in order to take care of the pests that you might have. Okay, um, in the past, um, the Master Gardeners, Mayor Master Gardeners have done two webinars and they are available through either the Maryland Extension Western Cluster YouTube channel, as well as there was um, an herb spile presentation back in 2016 that is still on the Cabaret Library's YouTube channel. Those are two other webinars that I would highly recommend if you want to specifically learn how to grow an herb spiral or even um, a tea garden. Of course, you can find the Cabaret County Master Gardeners on Facebook. I will post um, links to the two webinars that I just mentioned, as well as any books that I recommend. Um, you can find all that information on our Facebook. And here's the address. Okay. And now we're going to our, our um, craft. Um, do I have any questions that I need to answer before we move forward? And do we have time to do this, um, this craft? Elisa, you have plenty of time if okay. you want to walk through the craft. Okay. Um, did we have any questions that I need to answer? There were a number of questions about witch hazel, um, whether it's a a tree or a bush and if it's native to the area? Um, I'm not quite sure if it's native. Um, a lot of our herbs actually um, came when we colonized the, um, this country in the um, 1600s. 
So a lot of our herbs are actually not native. I'm not quite sure about witch hazel. I do know that you need a large space. In fact, I have a witch hazel that I still need to plant and I haven't planted it because witch hazel likes um, very um, well-drained soil. It also does not like a lot of sun, so it needs a little bit of shade. And also it needs a huge space. I think, I, I know it grows over six feet. Um, it, I'm not quite sure how big it gets, but I know it's gonna get huge. Um, so not only do you need a space that's a little bit um, on the shady side, but you need a large space for a witch hazel to grow. Any other questions? Okay, so there's no questions. Okay, so um, if you were to want to do this wreath that's right to the left, this is a wreath made out of lavender. Um, it took me about two years to actually harvest enough lavender, which is fine because you can always add as you go um, especially if you're creating a leaf like this. Um, not a lot of us have enough lavender <laughs> to do this in just a year. You would have to actually grow like at least four plants just to produce this wreath. Um, it can be done. Like I said, it took me two years. Um, but you can start um, a any wreath whether it's herb, whether it's your Christmas wreath, by creating wreaths using either one of the standard um, wire frames that you get, like at Joanne's or Michael's, or even the dollar store. <laughs> you can also use an old um, coat hanger, wired coat hanger. You can also create your your frame using honeysuckle, grape ivy, or English ivy. So let's go and first show you how to create a frame. I'm gonna mute um, this, the sound to this video because it wasn't quite loud. Um, so I'll describe what's going on. Okay, where's me? Okay. okay, so let's start this over. Okay, so when you start, um, you want to collect your, your vine. But um, when we were doing this video, we hadn't gotten rid of the leaves. So then now we got rid of the leaves. Better to get rid of the leaves before you create the frame because what will happen is if you keep the, the leaves and say you're doing an herb wreath, the leaves are gonna be entwined with the um, herb leaves. So you wanna get rid of all the leaves, whether you're using wild grape ivy, English ivy, or honeysuckle. And you start with the thicker vines and you create your silk girl. And then slowly, as you entwine from the larger, thicker vine, you entwine the thinner pieces into the circle. And you don't have to just use the circle. You can do circle, you can do a heart, you can do whatever. And you slowly entwine the smaller pieces of the vine into the circle. So you can go in and out. Um, you can wrap it around just to create your basic frame for your wreath. Um, again, make sure that whatever vine you use, you know exactly what vine you're using. You do not want to go and end up harvesting 
a whole bunch of um, poison ivy and poison oak and then end up having a really bad reaction. Know what kind of wreath you're going to um, use. Okay, let's see. So now I'm going to show you. So I had created um, that day two different frames, a big frame and a small frame. Um, small frames are great if you're going to decorate, like put a candle in the middle. Um, so you can use this technique um, to create a frame. But um, after you create the frame, so you didn't, you don't need to use wire when creating a natural frame. Um, it's not needed as long as you have a long piece of, of the honeysuckle or the grape ivy. You don't need wire. The only time you need to use wire is when you are actually collecting the herbs or the greens that you're gonna use for the wreath. So let's play this. Okay. So I start with my my frame, and um, beforehand I had cut fresh herbs to create this wreath, and I'm just making sure that the frame is the exact shape that I want, and I'm choosing branches the size that I want. So because this is a small wreath, I had to actually cut in half the rosemary that I was using for this project. So if you, if I were to use this um, or without cutting, it would have appeared way too big for this, this size. That would have been a perfect size for the bigger wreath that I have on the other side. But for this smaller wreath, I had to trim it down. So I'm going to cut half of it, but I'm also going to use the other part of it in order to create the wreath and I am collecting bunches of them and I am putting them onto the frame and then I'm going to use just some wire you can get it at any craft store um, heart um, you can probably get it at ace um, so you're just looking for a thin wire that's easily bendable for creating uh, in fact, this is recycled wire that I use for this project that um, I had created with in Christmas. So you bunch them and you wrap them. You have to make sure that there's still some wire left so that when you end the wreath, you have something to tie. I'm also adding some sage to this wreath so that it's not just a rosemary wreath. Um, it has a, um, a little bit of contrast using the sage. Um, for reefs of this kind, I would only use the woody kind of herbs. So the sage is the lavender and the rosemary. Thyme, um, I find I've tried to do herbs using thyme and oregano and the mints, and they just end up making a huge mess as well as you end up getting holes um, in your wreath um, when you're using those type of verbs. So you want to use something that's a little bit woody when creating this kind of, of wreath. So I am collecting a bunch of herbs and putting them into bunches. Also, when you're creating this kind of wreath, you want to do counterclockwise rather than clockwise. And this is towards the end. And what you do is you get your bunch and you fill in the gap. And you put it you put it in between the, the fir, your actual first um, bunches of, of um, the plant that you're using. And you make sure that it fills in so that when you go to look at the wreath, you don't see the hole. You, you pretty much don't even know where you started and where you ended. 
and then you get a little bit more extra wire so that you can twist it um, in the end. I was having trouble with the wire clippers yesterday. Okay, and so you don't want to you don't want to twist the wire in the front. You want to do this all in the back. Um, I've created ways where there was a little bit of um, a gap in the wire, and I could go, um, put it through a hole. But yesterday I couldn't find anything, so all I ended up doing was finding the beginning of the wreath and actually twisting it together. And it pretty much stayed um, together. And that's all you do. Um, you can use this like again, if you're trying to make a lavender wreath, it's the same technique. Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's go. Um, if you do not have that many um, herbs, like say you didn't have a lot of rosemary. Say you're starting, just starting out your herb garden, but you want something that you can use that looks pretty. Um, you can use, you can create what you call a uh, swag and you can hang these anywhere in your kitchen. Um, one thing about the swag is you can easily clip off the herbs and use them for cooking. This is the method that I actually use if I want to just collect a whole bunch of herbs and then use them then and there um, throughout the week um, as I'm cooking. Okay. Okay. Oops. Okay. Oops. Okay. So we're doing a swag. Um, so yesterday I collected majority of my herbs that were ready for harvest. Um, the lavender there wasn't quite, um, ready to harvest. It was actually just starting to bloom. Um, I don't recommend harvesting your, your lavender, um, if it hasn't bloomed yet. Um, I just wanted to show you what it looks like with a bunch of um, herbs. So I have lavender, rosemary, I believe that was some sort of mint like lemon balm, oregano, and sage. So um, when you're doing the swag, you start with the thickest, stemmiest herb, and then you go down the line to maybe not so sturdy. So yesterday I started with rosemary, then I started um, I put some sage. The next herb I believe I put in was the lemon balm or, nope, yeah, the lemon balm is it was the um, next sturdiest plant. And then I ended it with the oregano. And this is a spicy type of oregano. And I think the reason why I ended it with the lavender is for just the color contrast. Um, typically, if you, I had much more lavender, I would have probably put it behind the rosemary, but because I wanted to smell it, I, um, I ended the lavender. And you just have a little bouquet and then you get your wire. And then you wrap your, your, your bundle with the wire. And you get a little bit more so that you can actually twist a little um, hook for it so that when you go to use it, you can hook it like maybe on your cabinet, um, somewhere in your kitchen so that you can use it. 
So if you do not have a lot of herbs to harvest right now, this is probably by far the best um, way um, to use them. Um, you can also dry all your herbs like this, especially if you have a lot of them. This is the technique that they would have done um, in the past in order to dry the herbs. Um, so um, it's a great technique. You could probably put it on the table, especially if you have a large amount. Okay, let me get back. Oops. Let's see how. Okay, there we go. Let's see what else. Okay, and um, with the PDF that I'm going to share, everybody, I'm going to have recipes for chassés and teas, um, as well as I believe I have two um, scrubs that I'm going to share everybody to everybody. So I have a gardener's hand scrub as well as a hand and body sugar, sugar scrub. What else do I have? Okay, and then there's like a ton of, of books out there, but I will actually shrink it down to my top 10 um, when I go to email everybody, as well as I'll probably post something like top 10 or books onto the Facebook. Okay, and that is all I have for today. Did anybody have questions about how to create a wreath or anything? Okay, well, I thank everybody for, for attending this um, webinar and I hope you learned something. Lisa, there was one question about your, um, oh, maybe somebody else answered it then, uh, about the lavender and how you kept the color. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to make sure that you harvest lavender at their peak. Right now, lavender's not at their peak. They're just starting to bloom. Um, I have, um, I probably should take a picture of what um, my lavender wreath looks like. Um, it still looks pretty good. Um, I think lavender is just one of the few flowers that actually keep their color for a long time. Any other questions? Well, thank everybody so much for joining us today. Um, at the end of the presentation, you're going to be automatically directed to a brief library project outcome survey. Um, and we appreciate your feedback. It's really um, a simple little, little survey. And we appreciate you all coming. Thank you. Thank you.